Hill. Um, there are initiatives of cooperation uh, of fewer jurisdictions than uh, these large multinational uh, networks. Um, you and Fred have mentioned this issue and also Eleanor of collusion among small antitrust authorities. But for example, there's the MMAC, including Australia, Canada, New Zealand, the UK and the US uh, that have this cooperation. Here we have small uh, jurisdictions together with large ones, which is sort of different than the uh, agency collusion story we told before. So what advantages do such corporations have uh, versus, uh, for example, these international all country networks like the OECD, ICN, etc. And also, uh, how does the COVID experience uh, affect uh, this type of cooperation? So I'll start with the second first, David. Uh, I think the COVID experience is going to change the views of agencies about how to cooperate and the method you can use it has shattered the idea that you have to wait for big international gatherings to take place and to meet your friends either in the big room or at the famous margins at a coffee bar or in a cafe to talk about what to do. Uh, this technology with all its imperfections and it is not a complete substitute for the other face-to-face -face gatherings this technology has demonstrated that if you want to meet regularly, if you want to assemble capabilities from colleagues and counterparts around the world, you can do it. And I think what is evident in the experience of a number of agencies is that those kinds of discussions can be extremely useful. Uh, part of what happened with COAD and this, this, uh, this MMAC group, uh, the UK, the US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And I'm on the board at the CMA and I, I'm not a neutral observer in this process. Uh, but as a matter of process, I can observe that one thing all of them saw in COVID was that there was a sense of desperate necessity to have a conversation that went beyond giving a book report about what you were doing and to start talking in real time about what's working, what's not working. Almost daily exchanges across some of the big agencies saying, do you have an idea where the complaints are? What are the trends? Uh, what kind of soft power are you using? Is it working just to give a speech and tell firms we're looking at excessive pricing even if you don't have good tools to do with it? That is, what are you doing in real time? And a feedback loop is developed so that each of these agencies, you could liken them to hospitals dealing with a, a pandemic, a healthcare crisis. What are you doing to diagnose the problem and to treat it immediately? You saw the compression of conversations and discussions that might otherwise unfold over a long period of time happening daily, weekly, with an exchange of know-how. And I participated in this MMAC process where heads of unit and, and you know, think about how hard it is to get all the heads of units together, the two US agencies, the four counterparts and the others. Um, my experience is that heads of agencies don't suffer from a weak self image. And, and their view is my time is especially precious. Uh, they've all joined in these discussions. And the question is, what did we learn from that experience that we want to apply in the future? And there's a real excitement now, I think, about doing that. But part of what they realize is that this, this, this healthcare scourge forced all of them to do things they hadn't done before and to do them quickly. And there's a sense that there might be in this transformative ideas about how you can dramatically expand performance. You know, what are the, in our field, if we look at the, the, the breakthroughs that have happened, what were the breakthroughs? Leniency, that didn't come from nowhere. Pre-merger notification and a suspensory waiting period, that didn't come from nowhere. That is, how did the breakthroughs in our field take place? Well, they're thinking, where can we find them in this instance and carry that ahead and do that? Here's one of them. It's what the CMA did in building a team of technicians and data specialists, computer scientists to do data. 
And this was a far-sighted decision that senior management made several years ago saying, tech, uh, what do you need to do tech? Uh, have a lot of lawyers looking at tech? Yeah, that's good. Uh, how do you switch on your computer? Uh, let's see, economists? Yeah, that's nice too. But they realize if we're gonna do tech in a big way, we need, of all things, computer scientists. We need data specialists that we have something called big antitrust data that we haven't even begun to mine and analyze. And the CMA decided to create what's called the data team. The data team now has 40 people in it, 40. These are quants, these are computer scientists, these are economists trained in technology. And part of what was demonstrated during the COVID experience is that you can gather and use information to give you a much better idea of what's going on to support merger review and other matters. My suggestion would be that no agency that proposes to specialize in this field in the future will not have a tech team in the future, and it will not be a significant part. Uh, it was a realization that you can't do this kind of work unless you have the right teams. Uh, and I think the other agencies, which had variants of this, said, I'd like one of those too. I'd like to know more about how you do that. And in the context of this group, which has, broadly speaking, similar mandates, common language, yeah, that helps a lot, some, some expansive experience, to have the deep conversation that goes beyond everything's going fine out here to a much more specific discussion about what's working, what's not, and what new enforcement technology can be used to improve performance over time. And once you build that kind of habit and discussion, I mean, imagine the kinds of conversations you could have. Wouldn't it be interesting to have the regular conversation among agency general counsels? You're bringing these cases, what are you learning? What's it like in court? How are you doing with your reviewing courts? to have the conversation regularly among the chief economists, the conversation among the policy planners and those who are responsible for convening events. In other words, I think in this context, there's been the sense that we are operating well inside the production possibilities frontier, way inside. And that there are a lot of opportunities now to get out to that frontier through a much more expansive discussion of actual experience and current experience. And what's great about this unfortunate, horrible ordeal of COVID is that a number of agencies in their own experience said, yeah, that works. And there are a lot of ways to do this better so that the topic in many ways going ahead is how do we hang on to those things and do them better in the future? Thanks very much, uh, Bill. And it has to benefit, David, it's a, you know, where do, where do innovations take place? Prototypes, smaller experiments that are scalable. Uh, these are smaller experiments that are scalable. Absolutely. Uh, I personally wish uh, the UK would convince uh, the other jurisdictions in this group to start thinking about exploitative abuses because you know none of them uh, do and the UK does. So this um, well, if I, if I can if I can add a footnote, David, it's related to, to to Herb's and Fred's point. How many people on this screen five years ago said, "Let's see, there's a second year law student at Yale Law School who, by the middle of 2021, is going to be the chair of the Federal Trade Commission." How many of you saw that coming? How many of you saw how changes in ideas and external economic shocks can create opportunities for for changes in ideas? Uh, I'd suggest to you that although the equilibrium is not clear, all of those things in many ways as a matter of debate in the U.S. are up for grabs now, David. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and political scientists and public administration scholars years from now will be studying the case study of how the transformation advocates in the United States went from being a distant fringe to being at the moment at the center of an enforcement agency. And yeah, Herb's right, there are many rivers to cross. I assure you, it's a hard job to actually try to do it. But how many of you thought they would even have the chance? How many of you thought they'd be in the driver's seat? 
at all. That's a study worth carrying out. And I'd suggest to you from what I see in Europe and in places like the UK, there are policy entrepreneurs who are trying to replicate that in Europe as well by saying, you think Europe's so good off? Not so. I think, I think that conversation is coming, David. That's wonderful. Uh, it, it implies that hard cases make, make a good law rather than bad law. Uh, and also another thing that struck me is that um, these sort of um, intermediate uh, size corporations that you can choose your partners because there's a lot of differentiation among competition agencies. And you know, in the ICN, OECD, et cetera, it's great, but you don't choose your partners. You have to be with everybody. So that's another well, virtue. Although what I see there, David, is, is I think what OECD and ICN have inspired, I put UNCTAD there too, is the realization among countries that we can take techniques that have been developed in the bigger networks and replicate them on a regional or more local basis. We use the methodologies and we will work more with other jurisdictions with like-minded aims or similar situations. In, in a way, the, the, the larger networks have created a technology and know-how that has created spin-offs. Absolutely.